so hello, uh, good afternoon, good evening, potentially good morning. It's my absolute pleasure to uh, act as a chair for, for this uh, webinar. <clears throat> the title is The Future Food Safety, Can We Really Trust Predictive Analytics? I think it's a really, really good, very, very important question. So first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Chris Elliott. I'm professor of food safety at Queen's University, Belfast, and also professor of food security at Tamazat University in Thailand. And I've had a very long interest, not only in predictive analytics, but actually in artificial intelligence, probably 10 years of, of really asking lots of questions about, about this uh, uh, kind of a emerging technology. And I think AI, <clears throat> there has been a lot of, of coverage in the media about artificial intelligence. I think just in the UK alone in the last 24 hours, we've had two really positive news stories about AI. <clears throat> One about uh, the development of new antibiotics. The second was about somebody who was totally paralyzed, was able to walk again for the first time in many years. And, but also we've had uh, the, the media coverage about the potential um, catastrophic role of artificial intelligence. So I think this, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk about AI and actually demystify it to, to many people, because this is a very positive um, um, attribute we're, we're thinking about here is <clears throat> thinking about how we can prevent major food safety incidents happening. Because I think many, many people on our webinar, you know, there's there is about a hundred people register with, uh, registered for this webinar. I just kind of shows you how interested and important people are, are thinking about not only food safety, but in ways of, of moving from being reactive to proactive. So this idea of thinking about how we predict the future, I jokingly called it the um, uh, digital crystal ball. <laughs> But actually, it is about data. It's about data sciences. And I think you're, you're going to get a lot of information about actually how these data sciences actually work and actually function, the, the way that models are built and, and, and how they are checked in terms of, of their robustness. I think also just on the theme of data, it's really important to think about data in many, many different ways. How you go about collecting it, how you verify the data is accurate and correct, but also how do you trust where your data is going to, what it's going to be used for, and who might get access to that data. Hugely important questions. And again, there will be a lot of discussions about the integrity of your data. How robust is it? How safe is your data? Really, really, uh, I think a very, very important topic. And you, in, in, in this era of thinking about future food safety risks, you know, as a professor of food safety, this is a lot of what I do. We investigate big issues in terms of food safety, but we also try to think about what is coming down the line because of changes. And just to think of some of those changes that impact on food safety, I always say the number one change is our climate. And that is having a huge impact already in food safety and will have a lot more impacts going forward. Do we know now what they are? Well, the answer is no. Analytics, we will get a much better idea of those changes. But also what changes is people's perceptions in terms of what, what is a food safety risk. Often that will be brought about by changes in regulations and changes in legislation. And food safety legislation changes virtually every day of the week in some part of the world. And generally those changes in regulations are about 
lowering levels or increasing new hazards in, into risk management plans. I think the last area that I think we need, need to think about in terms of future food, food safety risks comes from something really positive. It comes from the desire of so many people to develop a truly sustainable food system. Very positive. But actually what sits behind the drive for sustainability are the unexpected consequences. And again, as, as, a, as a researcher, as a scientist, we are trying to think about what some of those unexpected consequences might be. Because in our terms of our drive for circularity, there will be new risks for sure. Some existing risks will increase in severity as well. And we have to try to get ahead of those, try to understand for all of these different scenarios that I've talked about, what might be happening in the future. Once we understand that, and it will not be with 100 degree of, of, of certainty, and again, we will talk about probability of, of, of events happening. But I think once we get that understanding, we can really start to change, to build, to modify uh, food safety management plans. So these are the topics that we're going to talk about today. Um, I am incredibly, I say, I'm incredibly interested in the subject. And we have two, what I would call, subject matter experts are, are going to impart us with, with a lot of information. The first is Manus, Manus Carbusis, who is the Head of Research and Innovation at Agrino. Agrino is a Greek AI company. We're also joined, uh, which is fantastic, by Yvonne Pfeiffer, who is Global Data Services Lead at ASGS DigiComply. So both of them are going to give us some information, some presentations. Hopefully we'll demystify, as I said, some, some, of, some of the areas around predictive analytics. But we want your involvement as well. And, and your involvement will come through. Please think about any questions that you might have. Just put them into the Q&A box. I will moderate those. I will ask as many of the questions as possible to both Manus and Yvonne. And who knows, I might even try to answer one of them myself, but I'll leave the, I'll leave the tough questions to Manus and Yvonne, that's for sure. But that's enough for me. Hopefully that's set the scene, that's introduced what we're going to do for the next hour or so. I really hope that you enjoy it. I hope you'll find it useful and helpful, thought provoking. So what I'll do now is I'm gonna hand over control to Manos. Manos, you're going to take us through for the next 20 minutes or so on your knowledge and experience around predictive analytics. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for setting the stage. Uh, you touched on so many fundamental issues around food safety, each of which uh, could be a separate webinar or could actually be even a, a project out of itself. In any case, hi, everyone. I am Manos. Uh, as uh, Chris said, I'm leading our innovation team at Agrino. And today, I hope I can help us all become that more confident that predictive analytics and food safety can work well and be applicable in real world situations with true business value. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is in part our internal work in Agrino and the Food Akai product, but we're also very lucky to be coordinating an important European Horizon project, which is called EFRA where we work together with SGS Digital Comply and many other excellent partners across Europe to advance the field of food risk predictions. So without further ado, let me get us started with the most provocative question I could think of. Uh, can we predict food safety incidents before they happen? Okay, no need to vote, but do take a moment to think this through. So what is your opinion? What do you think? Is this something feasible? Can we predict food safety incidents before they happen? And hold on to this answer for the rest of the webinar and we will revisit it. Okay, so personally, I have a background in computer science and today I will be supporting a rather bold statement. There is nothing left in computer science to achieve 
to be able to predict a vast array of phenomena. But it is true at the same time that in many areas and in many problems, machine learning and AI in general have not yet produced significant results in the real world. So if the fundamental tools are there, what are we missing? And why some of us voted yes in the previous question and some voted no. So my statement here would be that we are missing in most cases, two things. The first one is a good working understanding of what is feasible through AI. And the other is how we achieve good cross-domain collaboration. But really, as we'll see by the end of this presentation, hopefully there is no magic involved. And I will do my best to explain this today. Okay, so let's start with the first of these two things, understanding what is feasible. To understand this, let's start with two concrete cases where we can try to apply AI to get predictions for food safety. So in the first case, let's say I want to understand how salmonella will grow in my petri dish. This is an environment I can control very precisely and account for most influencing factors such as temperature, humidity, growth, medium, etc. I can very meticulously test different scenarios and note down the resulting growth. And with all these diverse data, there is a multitude of machine learning models I can use to create a rather accurate model indeed. And similar successful attempts can easily be found in the literature. But let's take a moment and think, what, what have I managed to create? I have created a model that answers the following question. Under a given set of conditions, how will bacteria evolve in my petri dish? Okay, let's keep this in mind and let's increase our scope a bit. Let's pose a new question where we hope AI can help us answer, will I have salmonella in my global supply chain? Instinctively, we can understand that the second problem is much tougher, even if fundamentally we're asking about the same pathogen, salmonella, and its growth and behavior. But the difference, of course, is that the factors that we need to take into consideration are much more numerous and the conditions cannot be precisely controlled to establish a clear causal relationship. So in my experience, when someone answers yes to the initial question, uh, if we can predict food safety incidents, I suppose they're thinking closer to the predictive example and when answering no to the global supply chain example. But today I would like us to start thinking in either of these two corners. So let's see. One example is much more complex and impactful since it is, it is much closer to the real world challenge we want to have an answer for. And the other has less impact since it is a laboratory deployment, but it's also less complex. Actually, there seems to be a trade-off between complexity and impact, meaning that we cannot freely move anywhere in this space, but we are more or less confined inside this band. But let's have a look at the visualization because it can give us an interesting idea. Is there potentially a sweet spot? That is specific, important questions we can state that we can actually answer efficiently through AI. Questions that have serious real world impact and for which we can account for enough factors to create a useful predictive AI model. So next we will look at such concrete examples moving around in this sweet spot. Okay, now let's turn to the second part. How cross-domain collaboration looks like when it's structured well. Let's look at this through various working examples, questions we can answer efficiently right now, today. So to get us started, let's say I am a food company and I have multiple facilities. I have a particular internal audit schedule and I wonder, can I improve on it by incorporating a data-driven and predictive risk assessment approach that is intervene when and where needed before it's too late? Developing a relevant AI model is an active area of research for us at Agronaut and well aligned also with the overall vision of our project effort. So my goal through this working example will be to showcase, hopefully in an easy to understand way, how collaboration in this cross-domain teams is structured but also so that using AI to predict food safety risks involves no magic at all, but it is a very structured process that anyone can get a feeling for 
and where food experts and computer scientists can work together to find really cool solutions to problems with real business value. Okay, so let's say we put together our cross-domain team. And the first thing we do when working with these cross-domain challenges is to understand why we're creating this AI model in the first place, which is not a given for many of the participants and that's understandable. So what are the things that makes us worried that we hope we can avoid or we can do better? This serves as a focus for everyone in the team and the motivation beacon. So in this case, the food, ex uh, food safety experts would share with us things like, I'm constantly worried that we might miss critical, uh, we might miss something critical and then sneak up on us leading to recalls or with our audit resources being so limited, it's really crucial for us to spread them out for the best outcome. And it feels like we're constantly juggling. Okay, next, it will be the time for the AI experts. We will look at the family of AI models that may be best fitted to the challenge given for what we're aiming for. Uh, let's say that after enough cross-domain discussion, we end up deciding that we're aiming for a data-driven approach prioritize internal audits based on a predicted time to incident. That is, which of my facilities is predicted to have an increased chance of food safety incidents risk related to the others, and what is an expected time frame for this. So the food company can then audit proactively and remedy the situation. Okay, so the computer scientist will say or think, this seems like asking, how long will a given facility survive without an incident? And the time dimension seems to be important. So one thing we can try is called survival analysis. This is a particular family of AI models that use multiple factors to predict a relative increase in probability of an incident over any desired time frame. But before we look into what survival analysis is and actually use it as an example for some deeper principles of what AI models do, let's go back to our cross-domain team and look at the most crucial part of the whole process, which can make or break this effort. So the next thing we do is where cross-domain collaboration is most, most crucial. Computer scientists and food safety experts, we have to sit down together to understand the factors that influence the probability of an incident occurring. Here, most likely, we also need to narrow down our scope to a particular type of incident so the factors can be traceable. So just remember this idea of the sweet spot. Okay, so when the food safety experts say factors, the computer scientists usually hear columns. This seems weird, but remember this. Along with the sweet spot idea, this I hope will be another takeaway message. So I will turn to an example now so we can understand what this means. And I know it is an obvious simplification, from some of the computer scientists out there, but I have found it to enhance cross-domain collaboration a lot. So when you say factors, I say columns. Okay, let's understand all this with an example. Another simple one. Let's say we're working with a poultry company and they own a series of facilities <laughs> in a rather complex supply chain. And let's say we're concerned for salmonella cause contamination incidents in the facilities and would like to intervene proactively based on the perceived risk. First, we have to make our goal clear at this stage. It is to collect data for the factors that influence time to salmonella incident in poultry facilities. And then we would start by monitoring some of the facilities, a representative sample, for let's say one year, 365 days. Some of the facilities will experience an incident and others will not. We also note various factors that we believe might be related to the arising of an incident. So to simplify a bit, let's say these factors are things like uh, a risk score coming from sample analysis, uh, a score for the high needs in measure used, a score for the feed quality used, if we're talking for funds, a score for equipment maintenance. Uh, for example, for, for a particular facility, let's say for the first row in this column, this facility remained uh, salmonella free for 112 days, it has a risk score of 10, a hygiene measure score of seven, fit quality score of three, equipment measure score of six, and it had an incident. It had it at uh, 112 days after the start of the study. Okay, 
The factors are oversimplified, but that is all really. So food safety experts will say factors, and computer scientists will say columns, columns in such a type of table. So if we can put enough columns in this table to make it wide enough, and also put enough records in this table to make it long enough, then we can trust that computer scientists can find an AI model that can produce great predictions. And no much will be involved. So, and another message, even if we do not put enough columns here in this table, if we, if, even if we cannot account for all the contributing factors, the AI model will still be useful. Uh, and I will return to that in a moment, but let me continue a bit with this example. So the next step involves only the, uh, the computer scientists. What we do then is to construct the AI model and do what we call training. That is present the model to the previous table. It is not as easy as it sounds, since it involves trying a lot of different arrangements, different techniques, curating the table, hyperparameterizing the model, but it is a set process that computer scientists know how to do very well. So let's not delve too much into this. But for example, in this particular case, we have found that the Cox proportional model works rather well. Okay. So what is the end result after all this? After we have found a good AI model, we have trained it with the table, what do we get? What we get at the end is an audit prioritization AI model which is a trained AI model that can use real-time records to output predicted time to incident per facility. So for example, the model may say that at facility A, we expect an incident in the next 50 days with a probability of 75%. So then the company can do an audit and take preventive measures before the incident happens. So let me very quickly also say uh, a couple of things for how we can incorporate time evolving factors as well. So in this example, we can see that scores can change over time. For example, due to the introduction of new measures for hygiene, this is something that there is an AI model for that. And of course, an advanced formulation of the approach would be that during the training of the AI model, we can connect it directly with the digital food safety system of the company, taking in the raw records as they are low, related to sampling outcomes, hygiene, feed, equipment, such records are in any case mandatory under HACCP and other food safety management systems, and the digital logging system can make this feasible. After training, the model will be ready to provide the online recommendations for facility audits. Okay, so let's wonder a bit. Is this still in the sweet spot or is it too much? <laughs> is it a bit ambitious? So let me say something again that I already alluded to. Even if we do not account for all factors, that is, no, we don't have all the necessary columns, can we create a qualitatively better data-informed approach that is better than the traditional approach? In many cases, yes. In our example, we can get a better data-driven approach over the HACCP-based standards for auditing. So let's keep this in mind and explore this idea a bit further. How far we can go? by not accounting for all the potential factors, but getting back useful results. Okay, this is going to be a rather strange slide, but bear with me. I will try to explain as much as I can. So let's start with a thought experiment. Let's say that in a perfect world, listeria incidents in the global supply chain are represented by this function. Okay, this is an ideal one, an ideal one, at least for an AI expert. And then I ask, how many incidents am I expecting next? Even without taking any factors into consideration, if the time series behaves so periodically, I could predict its future behavior, right? We all could. No magic is involved. Okay, let's keep this in mind. So one can actually construct however complex functions, by adding up periodic ones. So in this example, we, the sum of the three first factors generates the last one. So you know something that computers can do astoundingly well? It is to find such patterns. 
Here we are looking at a couple of straightforward examples for a human, but an AI model can analyze in the woven levels of such patterns extremely quickly and merely by its ability to do things extremely fast. It can find patterns with means, it can find them as easily as we can extend the line in the first example. But is this magic? No, it's just very fast computations. And it has, of course, its limitations. But it also has incredible capabilities that are applicable in real world situations. So here is an example of an AI model finding and using patterns over the real Listeria public incidents timeline. So let's take a closer look at this one. The actual time series of the incidents for Listeria that have gone public around the world is the black line. Now using what we call deep learning forecasting models, whatever that is, we can predict how the time series will evolve in the next months. And this is the red line. And to increase our confidence in the predictions, we also present the orange line, which is a prediction using the previous part of the black line to predict something that has already happened. So having the orange and the black lines closed intuitively means that we have good results and an increased confidence in the red line as well. So we can then ask, but why does this work so well? Because the computer has done pattern matching at an incredible scale and found patterns that exist but we do not have enough time as humans to find. Patterns much more interesting and deeper than the examples on the left, but in a sense, using the same fundamental approach as when we found patterns by looking at the time series on the left. Did we employ any magic to do it? No, it was rather straightforward. So when you do this with billions of pattern matching per seconds, many more patterns appear straightforward and no magic at all is involved. So currently, for Dakai, one can find interactive dashboards that nicely present the predictions of the trained AI models for many different food ingredients or food hazards tailored when it uses particular supply chain, however complex. Let me very quickly also say a couple of things about extreme event predictions, because I think I can almost hear what some of you are thinking. Can such an approach predict unexpected extreme events? For example, here is a famous case that you might remember uh, from here back. Well, remember what we said a couple of slides before, more factors means more accuracy. To account for extreme events, you need to put more factors, more columns in your data and more records. The better your table, the more you can accurately predict. But the AI model will remain useful. The red predicted lines will get qualitatively better the more data you have, even with a small table with few columns. But in essence, this means that adding more factors, more columns, we need to predict in more accurately, more and more extreme events that we previously could not account for with a small table. So this is what we're currently doing in the innovation labs of Agro, using more advanced AI models that can add such deeper patterns. Uh, and of course, apart from that, I personally would be very happy to sit down with any of you together with the science and food safety experts to create tailored AI models for your needs. Okay, very quickly, let me uh, talk a bit about for, uh, for our larger EFRA EU project that we're involved in and coordinating, where along with our partners, we're doing something very important, I think. Let me very quickly introduce you to those partners. It's Stockholm University from Sweden, Mahinigan from Safety Research from the Netherlands, Boypark from the UK, Sinar and Mace from Italy, Agrivi from Croatia, Reina from Greece, and us with you today, Agronom from Greece, and Nestia's Digital Comply. And with such an excellent group of organizations, we're also looking into deeper challenges as well. And for the remaining time in my presentation, I would like very briefly to mention one of them. So all the AI prediction models that we saw can be improved the more and the more diverse examples they encounter. So the, the wider and the longer the table, the better the predictions. And this has a very deep implication. Let's say we have our audit prioritization model set up and we have a company that wants to train it and use it. We do so and they do get back a useful model, but it is a model informed only by their own data. 
So in a sense, they only get a deeper insight in what they already know. But in the industry, there are also other companies with their own internal facilities. If the model could be trained over their examples as well, the final model would be much more powerful, in a sense, covering the entire industry rather than any particular company. Of course, any individual company would be hesitant to expose sensitive data. They might say, I want a model, but what if my data are exposed? What if the data is misused and my reputation is hurt? Whatever I would look into is to prove the concept that you can get the model without exposing the data. The high level idea is actually pretty straightforward. The model moves around the companies, getting trained with the local data. No data is moved around, only the model, making it stronger and informed by all participating companies. And the final model is given back to all participants. The devil is in the details, of course, and there are many of them, but the vision is clear to create sector-specific intelligence networks built around privacy-preserving AI. Okay, I just alluded to that. Uh, let me say, if you would like to learn more, with Chris, we're organizing a virtual summit on exactly this topic of intelligence sharing. You will hear about this from all viewpoints, business experts, regulatory experts, technical experts. We will be very happy to have you join us. This is the registration link. This is a QR code you can scan. And we will now send the link as well in the chat. Uh, keep in mind that we will also have interactive brainstorming sessions in small groups with any interested participants. So book your place in one of these meetings and have a say on how this important area will evolve in the future. That's all for me. Many thanks for that, Manus. Uh, I, I personally really enjoyed the presentation. Um, it, it answered some questions that I have, but it actually raised some new questions, which I may post to you later on. So please, for all of our, our attendees at the webinar today, there's a Q&A box, just type in, in your questions uh, for Manus, and hopefully we'll have time to answer them later on. I think that, um, uh, Let's say the the example that you gave around salmonella, I think, was really really good, and I I could I, I could see so many different applications for that. So so thanks. So what we will do now is we'll, we'll move on to the second presentation, if that's okay, Yvonne. We'll we'll ask you to to uh, give your um, uh, presentation around informing regulatory decisions with food risk intelligence. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chris, and also a warm welcome from my side. So my name is Yvonne from STSDG Comply. And um, after we have heard from Manus um, a lot of uh, interesting things about food safety risk prediction, I will talk about um, how we can also do regulatory prediction uh, for regulatory changes and why this is so important, um, especially for the food safety sector. Next slide, please. So um, if we have a look at food safety regulations, we have um, different challenges that we are dealing with. On the one hand, we have the regulators and the public authorities. And for them, it's really hard to implement new food safety, new food safety regulations or updates of this because it's a lengthy process that requires complex decisions involving multiple stakeholders. And um, if they are working on a new regulation, so they actually they are not able to use the one tool that combines regulatory data with food safety data so that they have all in place. Um, and they have to use several sources to get all the relevant data. And even if they have the data that they need, we also are dealing with the fragmentation of the data economy so that it's really hard to get all relevant information together. And another um, problem that they are dealing with is um, in some cases, so think about uh, the risk assessment that were performed from the EFSA, um, not all data are available and also must be generated within the study. And on the other hand, we have the regulatory affairs specialists in the food industry. And for them, it is not easy to find all relevant information that they need to be um, sure that they have everything in place. 
and then also if they have found them bringing all relevant information together so think about the food safety manager in a large company and he's not only responsible for europe he's also responsible for china and usa and they have to deal with different kind of regulations and um, it's not easy to find everything that they need and of course they also must be up to date follow changes in regulation and um, they are responsible to detect early triggers for a new regulation so think about for example mineral oils or PFAS. it's not a new topic we are discussing about these topics um, for several years but to detect such a trigger and to get an understanding what does it mean for my company which uh, processes must i have in place if the regulation comes is not so easy and that's the reason why next slide please um, that uh, one part of the um, EFRA project is the prediction of regulatory changes so and here the idea behind this is to to detect these early triggers to, to help um, on the one hand the authorities um, and the public sector but also the private sector to be better prepared if we have new triggers in food safety and um, next yeah, and how do we do that? So how we want to do that? So um, let's say um, for this project, for this part of the project, mm -hmm. we have the EFRA data and analytics marketplace. Let's say this is the heart um, of the project for this part. Here we want to combine regulatory data with food safety risk data, and um, also by combining such heterogeneous data and soft resources, we also touch the sustainability aspect so think about if we are all using the same database we could also um, low computational energy waste in real time and um, within the uh, by using the whole um, EFRA network um, we will have um, multiple particip participants who will attract and contribute um, walling and data mining software and give the data to the marketplace and on the other hand, we have the data consumers. And here we also want to um, involve authorities as potential um, consumers. And they can use our database services. And also of, um, here we will have the financial income. We start already uh, working on the first use case. Um, and this use case, next slide, please, is um, we want to have a look at um, pesticides and potatoes. Um, if you think about pesticides and potatoes, um, even if you only think about it in Europe, it's really a co complex topic because um, yeah, you have to monitor uh, several pesticides which are regulated um, from the EU database. But um, mm -hmm. if you are, for example, using um, our SGS DG compliance platform, um, this is the platform for food safety and regulatory compliance. Here we combine not only the regulatory part, we also have incidents and records in it. And also we use um, laboratory data of our laboratory network. And this also could help in the future to get um, a better holistic overview. And also it's helpful um, to follow policies and laws. So if you get an understanding about, okay, what um, are they talking about at EFSA? So which risk assessments are they performing? Then it's also easier to understand, okay, which regulations may come in the next few months. And um, so combining these several data will give you a good overview about the actual situation. And we also, um, started a project at um, DigiComply, which is called um, Smart Test Protocol. And here is um, also the idea by combining regulatory data with food safety data to uh, give you an easier way to update your test plan. So think about the potatoes. Um, you will have several um, 
sites that you have to monitor, but maybe you will also have other contaminants like heavy metals or microbiology parameters that you want to follow. Then um, each of these single parameters has a total risk based on the severity and likelihood. And due to the, com to the linkage to the regulatory data and the safety data and scientific data, you will get a really good overview and understanding which changes will come and which also will affect um, your test plan or your product quality. Um, but um, this here we have the focus on the regulatory data and food safety data. But uh, coming back to the um, our example for this um, EFRA project, um, pesticides and potatoes, we should all to have a holistic overview. We should also think about other topics, like um, think about the European Green Deal with the farm to fork strategy. So here we have targets for 2030 that we have to reduce our chemical pesticide usage by 50%. And of course, this also will affect the food safety topics. And um, then we have the climate change. So um, we are dealing with drought, heat, and water logging on the fields. And um, if you think about potatoes, potato plants are not stress tolerant, actually. There are some um, um, also research products to make them more stress tolerant, but if you're talking about today, uh, they are not stress tolerant. And uh, here we also have the consequences of poor harvest, poor quality, and of course, maybe also more pathogenic germs. So what I would say is, um, um, as also Chris mentioned it in, in his introduction, the climate change will have a large impact on food safety. And if we want to um, do a prediction also for regulatory changes, um, it, we should also follow not only the regulation of the food safety relevant part, but also for sustainability. And we have also should link to let's, um, weather data, for example, or other crises that may occur. So think about the um, Russian-Ukraine war and the supply chain interruption. This is also a topic that may affect the food safety. And um, yeah, this is what I wanted to present today, that um, if we want really to do um, prediction for um, regulatory da um, data, um, it's important not only to think about food safety data, we are talking about global food risk data and the goals for this part of the AFRA project is um, to have a real-time informing on regulatory decisions based on the global food risk data. Um, we want to reduce computational energy and resources, create an open food intelligence network and bringing together all the relevant stakeholders from the public and also from the private sector. And now I will hand over to Chris again, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that. Um, again, really good presentation. Um, I think very different actually from Manos because I think uh, you, you talked about very, very specific um, issues that are facing lots of businesses in terms of, of, of changes that are happening, the regulatory environment, sustainability, and how businesses really start to think about what the future risks are associated with those. So uh, it, it was a really good presentation. Oh, I, I have a number of questions I'm going to pose to both of you. But actually, I'm going to start off with there's some really good questions have come into the, the, the Q&A box. And again, I encourage people, please ask as many questions as possible. So <clears throat> there's a question from Felix. And I have to tell you, Felix, you beat me to it because I was thinking about asking a very, very similar question. And, and this one is for uh, Manus. And, and you talked about Manus, about um, the columns, OK? And, and to me, columns are different uh, sets of data. And, and, you know, I think in the example that you showed around salmonella, I would call those direct measurements, okay? What's happening on the farm? What's happening with the feed? But what about indirect measurements that may well be uh, uh, um, 
capable of, of, of building the, the robustness of the models. Felix comes up with a couple of examples around, say, human behavior. And, you know, everybody says food safety is a culture. OK, so what about human behavior aspects? What about uh, inputting weather data as well? So what are the, the chances of starting to, to put in some of those indirect uh, columns in, into the, the, the model building to increase the robustness? Great. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Felix, for this question. You're, of course, right. Uh, the more factors we can account for, direct or indirect, we let the end improve the model. Uh, and even if, in a case, we have too many factors, some, some of them only indirectly related to what we're trying to do, AI experts have a way of measuring which of these factors are the most relevant for the question at hand. So there is no problem in this direction. But let me let me rephrase the question a bit and say this. Um, even if we do not account for all the important factors, we will get a useful AI model. It might be an AI model that overlooks something. That's true. But again, it will be a useful AI model because it will have the ability to notice things that a human doing the traditional way of approaching this problem might miss. So let's not look at the, um, you know, at building the most powerful AI model that can be built and writing down all the possible factors. We can do great strides, even with the most, the first things that we can think about, the first factors, the most important factors. Noting them down will have a very real impact. Thanks very much, Manus. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, pose another question from, from our audience to uh, Yvonne this time. And I, I think it's very much involved in terms of, of regulations. And uh, Brendan asked the question about the sugar beet industry. And, and currently in Europe and the UK, the harvest has been severely affected by blight and reducing yields. Part of that has been driven by regulations about, about the use of agrochemicals that can be used in that particular crop. And now we're finding sugar being imported from different countries around the world, which you know, is contributing to environmental footprint, but also have a very different regulatory framework. So is, you know, in terms of changing supply chains and the risks associated with those changing supply chains, is this something that you know you're already thinking about, Yvonne, in terms of of this uh, area of of the um, the regulatory environment? Yeah, the two is also complicated. So if if you have inter, um, yeah. even if um, yeah, it's um, due to a regulation that you have to change your supply chain, or if we have an interruption of the supply chain, different types um, are possible. But of course, even it's not easy. To have all the let's talk, think about restricted substances which are regulated in the countries and um, in some countries it's, um, more or other active substances for pesticides are allowed than in europe and it's really not easy um, to to follow it or to be up to date and um, i think to regulate this um, it, it also not work i think um, yeah i don't know um, if you think about also the climate topics. This will go hand in hand. So on the one hand, we have uh, more regulations or restrictions using pesticides. On the other hand, we have the climate change and the, we have to deal with all of these topics. And um, yeah, it's, it's not easy to answer. I think. Oh, th thanks very much for that. Uh, I think this is this is a question actually for both of you, it's okay. And uh, maybe I'll come back to you first again, Yvonne. There's a question about um, the development of AI models and in terms of fraud. And, you know, will AI be a tool that will actually help detect fraud in supply chains? Or will AI be a tool which will be helpful to the fraudsters to deceive supply chains? There's two very different approaches there. I think um, if we are talking about fraud, we have several aspects that we have to follow. So um, I think about the type of fraud. So, um, but of course, if you um, select different types of data, um, even if you think about, okay, how many honey, for example, is 
could be produced. And if you follow these numbers, of course, then you will able to do prediction and can can, can say it by, by today. Okay, um, but um, I, you cannot sell so so much honey because it could not be not could not be so many produced. So I think for these topics uh, it's easier. But if you think about uh, spiked products, for example, it's not not too easy. Um, I think it's really depending on on the type of food for what we are discussing. But um, Manos, what do you think about it? Thanks, Yvonne. Manos, what's your view? Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks, Chris. Uh, this is a very interesting question because it's a, it alludes to an interesting counterbalance between uh, having tools for a good purpose and using the same tools for a bad purpose. So one could frame the question, okay, who has the better tools? Is it the good guys or the bad guys? The truth is everybody has the same tools. Uh, computer science offers these models to everyone and more or less uh, all actors have access to the same power of tools. Uh, what is the real question here is who has access to the intelligence and who has access to the data that can train these models. And that is why it is extremely important for the good guys, for the food industry, to start sharing this intelligence, share it in a confidential way and make sure that they train their models with all the data they have as an industry, sector-wide. So they create the most powerful models and nobody else has access to this data to do any harm. And on particularly this topic, we will have a very nice discussion on the summit of Real Chris, where you will show two very interesting initiatives, Finn and Food Fortress, and how they're helping exactly in that, especially Finn for authenticity and integrity, right? Thank you both. Um, there, there's another question has been asked and, and believe it or not, it's virtually identical to the question that I wrote down in, in case there weren't enough questions coming in. But I will tell you, there's a lot of them. Uh, sorry, Yvonne, it's back to you again. And I think it fits in with the smart test protocol that, that you talked about. And certainly with changes in, in legislation around pesticides, be it, be it fungicides, uh, herbicides and so forth, we're likely to see, um, I think, undesired consequences of that. We will get increased uh, problems with mycotoxins. We may get increased problems with, with um, microbial contact agents. So is this part of what you're trying to develop in terms of this uh, smart test protocol? Or again, is that something further down the line for future? No, no, I, uh, this is definitely a topic for the future. So um, we started working on it and also firstly to connect the regulatory data with food safety data, but um, it's totally interesting. And um, one important part, if you think about, okay, how can we detect new triggers to, to have the holistic overview and see, okay, when we are reducing um, substance X, Y, Z, what impact will it, will, would that we have? So think about, for example, ethylene oxide. Um, we are using it um, to avoid the contamination with salmonella, for example. And if you look at the recalls in this time where we have the ethylene oxide problem, let's say, then you can also see, okay, um, we, but um, we have also de um, detected more salmonella um, in, in such samples. So I think it's really interesting to see the, um, not uh, see it per hazard, you have to see it per commodity or pro product and see, okay, which possible hazards I can have in this product and how um, will they affect each other. Thanks. Manos, back to you. And this is a topic we have talked about quite a lot and we're going to be talking about it quite a lot again in, in just a couple of weeks' time. But it's about um, how can regulators and private sectors work better together? But what are the hurdles? What are the barriers at the moment in stopping that happen happening in the food safety domain? So, Chris, if I understand correctly, um, 
this alludes to the problem of okay, if I share my data, um, am I inadvertently exposing myself to any legal liabilities uh, concerning this data? Uh, so, for uh, from what we have seen from the field, from successful initiatives such as Fin, the regulators understand the very important uh, role that private intelligence networks uh, have to play. So in a sense, the food industry tries to regulate itself. And we have seen, at least in the UK, through the example of FIN, that regulators understand that and are actually cooperating well and within the boundaries of such a private intelligence network and are actually trying to be helpful. Chris, actually, I think this might be an interesting question for you to chip in as well. What do you think? How, how have you seen this interplay between regulatory bodies and FIN in the UK? Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there is massive tensions in terms of sharing sensitive data. Absolutely right. And, and it's not difficult to understand why those problems exist. It's about protecting your business, protecting reputation, all, all sorts of different factors. And regulators love to collect data. Absolutely love it. Regulators really don't like to share data themselves, actually, and, and that's from experience. But in, in FIN, which is, for, for those of you who don't know, it's it's Food Intelligence uh, uh, Industry Network, which operates in the UK, but there are many national and international companies. And we have found a way, we've found a wonderful mechanism of sharing data safely between companies, but also between companies and regulators. And what I will do now is, this, this is a wonderful opportunity to advertise our first international summit on, on, on uh, privacy and uh, uh, for food risk intelligence. I, I would really recommend that you sign up for that. There's going to be some phenomenal presentations about this particular topic. So what, what I'm going to have to do now is, I think first of all, thank all the people for asking questions. There's more and more questions coming into the chat box, but we, we have a little bit run, run out of time to deal with those. I think the questions have really um, been incredibly good because they have pinpointed some key areas of both the presentations of Manus and, and Yvonne. I want to thank you both for, for your presentations. They were really, really good. And, and, and personally, I've learned a lot from both of them and it's got me thinking about, uh, about various things. But it is, I think, you know, at the outset, I talked about demystifying the whole area of artificial intelligence. And really, to me, it's good mathematics. <laughs> it is really good mathematics, good mathematical modeling. And the more data, the more inputs that you have into the model, the more robust they get. And probably, I think Manolis would agree with me, is the predictions can, go, can look even further ahead based on, on the quality of the data, which again is very important because we didn't get a chance to talk about how far ahead can you foresee a food safety risk? Is it one month, three months, six months, one year? And really a lot of that is about the quality of the data that goes into building, building the model. I think Yvonne covered really nicely the, the, the area about regulations and, and you know, regulations are changing. And I think Probably one of the biggest driving factors of changing regulations for food safety will be food security going forward, because many parts of the world now understand that the, the world's food system is not as robust as we once thought it to be. I think the, the uh, global pandemic, the war in Ukraine has, has really highlighted that. And there's going to have to be, I think, much more risk assessment, much more risk management around around food safety in terms of really thinking where the priorities lie in terms of auditing, in terms of testing. And I think predictive analytics is going to play a huge role in that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, say thank you for to our speakers, Manus, Yvonne. I want to thank all of you for joining our webinar today and all of those who asked questions. And I hope I hope you all found it very helpful and, and, and useful as I did. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Yvonne. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice evening.